I was born in London, but um, moved 35 miles east when I was 11. And uh, I was really cross about this because I'd imagined my teenage years would be spent in clubs in Camden Town and they were spent in a village bus shelter. Um, but I realized when I left Essex again seven years later that it had really affected me. It was, it was character building. So this is my tribute to the spirit of Essex and my tribute to you, Hannah, because it's lovely, lovely to hear your poems again. Essex Kiss. A handbrake turn on a hairpin bend, merry-go-round, no, the waltzer. A tight pine hull with old as rum and peppermint. Chewing gum and whelks, a whiff of diesel, crocus, cuckoo spit. The moves of a half-broken pony, a poacher's tickle and snare. I will lay you down on a bed of nettles and blackthorn. Your body will give way like grain. Your body will veer, smoke over a torched field as the wind takes and turns it. The grip of bluebells, the grip of wattle and daub. As near as twelve laybys, as far as a Friday night lock-in, by this are we bound, no paperwork. And that's the spirit of Essex, no paperwork, isn't it? A dentist's <laughs> drill and no paperwork. Uh, another thing I discovered in Essex was music. I had started listening to music obsessively, really, when I was about eight, but cluelessly. And then I moved to Essex, and after a couple of years, decided that it was probably a good idea to make some friends. And that meant b being a girl, and I was really very, very bad at being a girl. Um, but I, d I was ambitious, and I decided to try and become like the purest form of girl I saw in front of me, which was the disco girl. And uh, I never, I could never really hack it, but there we are, I tried. And during this, this sort of brief period, the thing that I enjoyed and was, was dancing, and it, it, it was very interesting that these girls who bound themselves by such strict rules of appearance, they all had to look alike, you all had to have your hair like this and wear these shoes and your makeup like this and remove everything about you that was messy or smelly or anything like that, um, that they gave themselves with complete abandon to music. So this is called um, Silent Disco. And have, it, do you know what a silent disco is? Oh, it, instead of people gathering in a room and dancing to music, they gather and put on headphones and dance to music. And I thought this was a terrible thing until one day I tried it and uh, I thought it was great. <laughs> um, and the, the, the poem is called Silent Disco because it's trying to capture something about dancing, which is that we both abandon ourselves and also become ourselves more than ever somehow when we dance. Silent Disco. She's dancing to a song you can't hear to inner signals rather than noise. They give such pure direction for once there is an only way. She's not listening, something's arising, a thought that has to be kept moving, a place in herself that was once so full. You think you know her by that gesture, the flick and twist of her hand as it lifts to catch at her nape as her head tips sideways, but this is routine. A move perfected while she was waiting long and quietly for someone to let her in. There followed the summer of dancing, out in the dark beyond the last houses, among the sneaking holly and dogwood, in a breeze block creosote prefab temple. By day, a world of jumble and cordial. By night, a heaven of line and ring. The look on her face is filling the room. Someone else would describe it as joyful, only to you it is space she is taking. And you will never have seen her so clearly 
So within, she forgets herself as seen. She is pure direction. She is line and ring. There is not enough dancing in the world, I think. Certainly not in my life anymore. The literal body. That for all her young womanhood, a broken instrument lodged in her jaw. That in removing the sharp, they raised the roof of her mouth. That her sight failed within a year of being where she couldn't. That when in love, she suffers a loss of sensation on the feminine side. That what her body remembers most clearly is being held by breaking glass. That when in love, she loses the ability to digest. That her skin is feathers and her teeth are eggshell. That she is knuckle and sinew. That she is low. That she is pale. That in times of uncertainty, every doorway is glass. That she blooms in the falling away. That the pain starts on the feminine side behind the eye. That in sleep, her body braces itself as if high in a chimney or well. That when in love, she loses iron and rhythm. That the displacement of cells is a fire in a darkened building where against all expectation her lover keeps looking for her, keeps taking her hand. This is, this is very much a, a book about the body and a, a book about what we cannot know about the body or know about ourselves. Um, and this poem, it's also a book about the body of the poem and how that becomes and, and what we can and can't know about that. And this poem is called Kata, which is um, the name for a series of movements that you learn in karate, which is something I did a very long time ago. And, uh, but it's a kind of dance um, in tension with space. And... Uh, and it really, it, as I said, it's really just a, just a poem about a poem. It's a poem about how a poem occurs, I suppose. But like all poems, it's also about sex and death. <laughs> Kata. A dance between movement and space, between image and imperative. Each step an arrival of the familiar within the unknown. The gravity of form and the mechanism of each gesture, as profound and dissolved as the body's memory of a stranger who said nothing but, in passing, met with you in stillness, wanting to go no faster than this. And this is really not about poems. This is really about sex and death. <laughs> um, it's called Acteon, and it's about the myth of Acteon, who came across the nymph Diana while she was bathing, and uh, she saw him looking at her, and she turned him into a stag, and he was hunted to death by his own dogs. And this, as an image of the absolute uncontrollable nature of desire, and how it goes in us like a switch at a deeply unconscious level, I think the myth is extraordinary. And I wrote the poem after seeing a picture of it, a very old picture in Prague Castle, where Acteon, the prince, he was, he was all prince up to here. He had sort of blue velvet pantaloons on and flounces. And then from here, he was a stag. And what struck me about this switch to, to lust, to desire, was that it happened in the head first not in the body, it was the mind that got lost before the body followed. And I also was interested in Diana 
as a figure of great power and that she also, as he is helpless, she is helpless to something too in what she emanates. Acteon. He walks his mind as a forest and sends of himself into dark places to which he cannot tell the way. The hunt comes on and he and his nerves streams ahead, hounds flung after a scent so violent, no matter the path or what's let fall. A burst of clearing, water, beads and feathers her presence as she thickens and curves. He says words to himself not to look, but his eyes are of their own, and she at their center, a dark star, contracting to itself, discarding wave on wave, on flare, on fountain, his skull erupting, branching, and his blood is shaken down, and he is all fours, and his noise, and his hounds. I, over the course of a year, I went to the four corners of Britain for each of the solstices and equinoxes, and I'm going to read you two of the poems that arose out of that. The first was um, going to Orkney for the winter solstice, so the shortest day of the year, I went as far north as I could, and then, because that wasn't cold and dark enough, I went inside a Neolithic burial chamber and waited, because when the solstice sun hit the horizon, a beam of light was supposed to come through this tunnel and hit the stone at the back of the chamber. And we waited for two hours, and it was like being stuck in a lift. There were two boys who'd come from the pub, there were two Dutch academics, there was the sort of the man who was the tour guide who was talking to somebody on his phone about his holidays. And, uh, and it, felt, it felt incredibly ordinary. And then suddenly the sun started appearing in this tiny flicker coming along the path. And it was extraordinarily thrilling, actually. Um, but then, of course, I think when the world realized it was winter, the, as soon as the sun did this, clouds appeared and snow started falling, and it, it never hit the stone. But I was, actually, I was actually quite relieved that it never hit the stone, because two of the people with us who looked like, please forgive me if you're one of these bird watchers, um, they looked like a perfectly normal couple. Um, as soon as the sun started traveling along, they started whipping off their jackets and pulling out drums. <laughs> so I think I was, uh, I was quite glad we, that it never got there um, and we could all go safely home. Um, and I wasn't sure what was going to happen. So this is, it's called Winter Finding, which one is one of the old names for the autumn equinox. So um, I think I'll just read you, I'll read you Winter, the Mezha one, and then the spring one, which was in the foul estuary in Cornwall, where they have these extraordinary tides, and you end up with seaweed in the trees. It's very, very deep water where they park enormous ships. Um, so this is about, that's about the sort of, the, the, the extreme push towards conception, really, of, of spring, that spring needs these, these extremes in order to, to get where it has to go. So maize how. The year's contraction, sun rolls, sky rises, and is long gone. Not to see the framing steepness, you lower your head. You are line, a form of utterance from last to next, no more than murmur, as light pulls into the seed of itself, a held breath, your body, an earthbound chamber. Why rush past into whiteness? This is the time of the dark half, the serpent days of seam, scribbles of lust and brag, speak like needles on the skin. And that last image there comes from the fact that the inside of this Neolithic chamber is covered in Viking graffiti. So it is like being in an Essex bus shelter. <laughs> And it says things like, you know, Brunhilde walks it like she talks it. I mean, it's totally, <laughs> totally bus shelter stuff. Um, so, 
foul estuary. The night train's chain of events, what could be brighter? Window by window, shocking and invisibly connected, as if we travelled on our nerves. At the end of the line, a milky geography of salt and chalk, seaweed caught in the arms of an oak, a streaming field where a hare starts out of the earth, wheels like a girl, woken and told to surface. Now? Now. The hare, the girl, break up into a dance of unready yellows and greens. I'll read three more. I'm going to read one about my daughter, in which I... You know, I'm always saying this to my students, you have to be ruthless with, with the truth. That's not, it's a different question to authenticity. But I felt terrible because I changed her age in this poem <laughs> because, it, because of the cadence. I had to change it from 21 to 19. Um, she was quite affronted, actually. Uh, but the, the poem arises, as my poems do, often very slowly, uh, and often out of an acutely physical experience. And this was one where she was living in Berlin, and um, I went to see her, and some friends took us to an aquarium. And at the end of the aquarium was a hall of mirrors. You know a hall of mirrors? And it's the most extreme hall of mirrors I've ever been in. I could not take one step. And my daughter was way ahead of me, and she had to kind of turn around and direct me. But there were 20 of her telling me which way to go. And the sort of combination of my obsolescence and helplessness and this idea that she, I didn't know which was the real her seemed, said something to me about that point at which your child stands and looks back at you. They step out of their childhood and she is a young woman and she's looking back at me. And I'd been thinking for a long time separately to this about an idea I had from when I, I studied Dutch, uh, early Dutch, or 17th century Dutch painting, which was the moment of s capturing things as if, really as if you don't know what you're looking at, which is an extremely hard thing to do. And this idea of empty metaphor, and that just that moment where something really does look like nothing else, before we bring to it everything we think it might be or looks like. And so I've, I've sort of tried to get that in my daughter, that point of separation. And if it weren't for her, I'd still be in that hall of mirrors. It was terrible. Empty metaphor. The last room was a hall of mirrors where my child stepped past. Nineteen, about to be described, and yet to meet her explanation. At the point of exchange, she became so unknown, so clear, that I could not tell glass from air. While we're still on, in the, I mentioned Dutch landscapes. Um, this is an elegy for my favourite relative. Um, we all have one, somebody who's not necessarily a brother, sister or parent, but somebody more distant with whom you have a very natural and strong connection. You look at each other and you get each other and you love each other. And my aunt, Isla, was this for me. She was also as in everyone in my family is this kind of thing. She was a consultant anaesthetist, so she spent her life making people unconscious. Um, and at the end of her life, she was one of those people who was completely intellectually with it still, but her body had fallen apart. And she, couldn't, she could barely see. And I, she met me at the National Gallery, and we walked up to a, a picture I love of a very deep Dutch landscape. And she pulled out a sort of telescope and held it right up against the picture. And I realized it just didn't matter. It, was, um, it wasn't about what she saw, but the sort of space that she imagined. So when she died, again, this took, this took me about five years to really to get outside and, and be able to write. A Dutch landscape for Isla Maguire. I was telling you what Fromentin said about walking around inside the painting when half blind you pulled out a spyglass and settled at an irrelevant distance. Two weeks later when we said goodbye, your gaze sought me inside myself like someone peering through a telescope across dark fields. You saw your patients through their sleep as if the body, now unframed, 
where space unfolding into space, field on field, and somewhere in the dark, the child. How long the sky retains its brightness when sky is so much of it. And I'll finish with a poem I wrote really as a warning to myself about when poems are going rather too well, when you hit the kind of gallop and you think, oh, and it's happening and it's happening, and then you wake up in the morning and look at it and think, maybe not, maybe not yet. Um, but it's a very necessary part of writing, the, the allowing yourself to be carried away. And somebody who was very good at understanding this was Coleridge, and he understood the, the need to work at both extremes of absolute control and precision and rigor. And then the thing I find hardest to teach, the when to let go and when to just let something happen or to trust where it's coming from. Um, and he has an image in his writings about this of the light control of the reins of many horses, which gave me this poem, Coleridge. So great a storm I rose in the night, my mind in the hills, a dream of lateness. What was it in my countenance that made them harness thirty horses? When at last they pulled together, we travelled with such speed and force. The driver threw the reins aside. Everything that's for us is against us. We're going nowhere tonight. Thank you. And I'd like to thank... Susie and Chris and Hannah and all of you, thank you very much. <laughs>